Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. We have received apologies from Ian Gray this morning. Item 1, decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take items 3 in private? Thank you. Item 2 is post-legislative scrutiny, biodiversity and biodiversity reporting duties. I'd like to welcome our participants this morning and thank them for coming along. The purpose of the evidence session is to hear directly from stakeholders on the extent to which they consider that the biodiversity and reporting duties placed on public bodies have been successful and what, if any, improvements could be made. We would like the discussion to be free-flowing and you are welcome to ask questions of each other. However, we still want some structure, so please indicate to me or the clerks here if you would like to contribute. When you speak, your microphone will be activated automatically, so there's no need for you to touch it. Can I ask all MSPs and participants to very briefly introduce themselves before we begin? I'll start. I am Jenny Mara. Um, Member of the Scottish Parliament for North East Scotland and convener of this committee. I'm Craig McAdam, Vice Chair of Scottish Environment Link and convener of their wildlife subgroup. Uh, Liam Kerr, I am the uh, I'm also a member for the North East Scotland and deputy convener of this committee. I'm Sally Thomas, I'm Director of People and Nature for Scottish Natural Heritage. Alec Neil, MSP for Airdrie and Shots, and I give my apologies in advance. I need to leave at ten thirty if we're not already finished by then. Convener. I'm Fiona Stewart. I'm Director of Estates and Facilities at National Museums Scotland. Colin Beatty, MSP for Midlothian North and Musselburgh. Alison Anderson, a Green Space Team Leader for Dundee City Council. Uh, Bill Bowman, Member for the North East of Scotland, also. I'm Willie Coffey, MSP for Comarnock and Irvine Valley. I'm Lloyd Austin, I'm uh, Head of Conservation Policy for RSBB Scotland. Thank you very much indeed. The first theme is how we believe public bodies understand the biodiversity and reporting duties placed on them. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to kick off. Thank you, Vera. I think uh, the, this whole scrutiny started because of a perception which came forward that perhaps uh, public bodies were not understanding the role, were not carrying out the reporting that, uh, that, uh, was, that, that was a duty that was placed on them. Do you think that public bodies value and understand this reporting process, given the fact that only 44% of public bodies actually respond, which means 56% don't bother for one reason or another? What's your take on that? Do you, think, do, you, do you think they actually understand what they're supposed to do? They understand the importance? Who of our witnesses would like to kick off? Is the, du is the duty understood? Lloyd, Lloyd Austin. Um, yeah, thank you, Kavina. Um, I, th I think the honest answer would be that it's mixed. You know, I think the figures that uh, you quoted in terms of the number of respondees and obviously um, the reports on the substance of each of the one reports that have has been done sh suggests that it's mixed. And I think that probably does kind of highlight one kind of flaw in the process rather than the understanding of the individual public bodies. And that is that it's, it, it, there's a kind of assumption that every public body should do exactly the same thing. And I think that's one of the problems in terms of um, the... What, what we in the NGOs view as the missing stage in the biodiversity duty and strategy process, in a sense, that uh, we have a strategy and we have um, uh, a duty to report on actions, to, uh, a duty to report on the implementation of that strategy, but the strategy isn't converted into clear actions as to who does what when, um, and therefore it's very difficult for the public bodies to know actually what they are expected to do, what, when and how. And if, if those actions were slightly clearer, then it would be easier for the responsible bodies to report clearly on the actions that had been assigned to them. You believe there's, that there's no clarity how the reporting should take place? 
Is, it, is that am I, am I No, I think there is guidance on how the reporting uh -huh. takes place, yes. Uh, but I think it's in, in terms of uh, the actions, linking the actions to the overall um, priority species and habitats that are on the biodiversity list and so on, and the actions that are needed for the conservation of those species as opposed to just general good practice for biodiversity, that's, that's the area that's, that, that's the, the challenge, I think. Sally Thomas. Could I just comment in, res in response to that? So the, um, the Scottish Government, as I'm sure you're aware, undertook an evaluation after the first round of reporting. And um, in response to that, one of the things they asked SNH to do was to, val to develop some further guidance and information, reporting templates and case studies to help public bodies. Um, and actually stressing that, you know, it isn't, it isn't necessarily that every public body needs to report in the same way um, and that there are a whole range of activities which bodies undertake which can contribute to their duty. And certainly anecdotally, we, we've had feedback that that has been very helpful to, to public bodies in terms of the way they report. So there has been a lot of work done in the last couple of years to try and make it easier for bodies to understand what it is they're required to report against and how the work that they undertake as part of their you know, day-to-day -day running of their organisation can contribute and help to contribute to delivering the duty. Craig McAdam. I, I think that, though, that if you look at some of the reports that are coming in for this round of reporting, there's still some confusion over what the outcome that they're meant to be reporting against is, because uh, some of the reports are heavily into sustainability and very little biodiversity. So I think, you know, as, as Lloyd says, you know, actually defining the outcome that you want from that, that uh, from the biodiversity duty would actually, and then reporting against that would uh, clarify things. Any for Fiona Stewart. Um, I concur with what um, has been said in terms of defining the outcome uh, and providing, uh, I think in our response we said in general we felt there was an uneven level of understanding of the duties across the bodies and I think it comes down to what we're saying by the outcomes, making them a bit more clear for the different types of organisations and sizes of organisations to be able to respond more um, appropriately. Fiona, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your submission um, said that you know the biodiversity duty or biodiversity wasn't a core function of, of what you do at the uh, National Museums of Scotland. Um, I mean, do you think actually this, there shouldn't be this duty on public bodies to, to report? I think there's a, a benefit to raising the profile of biodiversity um, and obviously improving what we do. Um, the, as we did say, it's not necessarily our core business, but we do. Um, we did do a report and we collated information from our learning and programmes and our natural science colleagues to show what we do in terms of biodiversity. Alison Anderson. Um, I'd just like to agree with Lloyd. Um, I think Dundee City, I can only speak for Dundee City Council and I can't speak for local authorities, but in our area, I'm sure you'll be aware that it's a, it's a very urban area, it's a really tight administrative boundary. We have lots of different competing priorities to, to deal with. And um, we, we don't have a biodiversity officer and we're not part of a, we don't have a, a, biodi a local biodiversity partnership. So we would welcome some guidance, some tailored guidance, I think, for Dundee about where we fit in the national scheme of things. Um, if you ask Dundonians what significant biodiversity is, they'll come up with robins, blue tits. And, and, and in, to be honest, in a national scheme of things, that's, that's, they are important, but they're not of national um, significance. We have invasive species, but yet looking at the the... the Scottish biodiversity strategy, there are other things that we, we, we don't have influence on. So it'd be really nice to have a kind of link between what we are locally and what we can do nationally and, and really be tailored to Dundee. So I'd appreciate some guidance. OK, that's useful. And how do you feel as an individual local authority about the duty to report? Um, you'll be aware that we haven't reported in the first round, but we actually have done for a second a yep. second report, which is not on the website. Um, we sent the link in December, but it still hasn't been put up on the website. So I assumed that it had been 
and I looked last week and it wasn't there, so I kind of sent an email and it's been confirmed that they received the link, but it's not up on the website. This is submitted to the Scottish Government, mm -hmm. so you feel from local authorities' point of view, you've done the work on this, you've submitted the information, but it hasn't. nothing's been done with it? No. That's useful to know. Any further points here at this? Do anyone like to, you know, I think my question was, what is the duty useful? Um, to the duty to report, Lloyd Austin. Yes, yes, I think it is useful. Um, I entirely take Sally's point about the guidance and the work Scottish Government has done to make it easier, but I think there's more that can be done in that direction, and I think that, that there's more to be done, I think, as Alison said, to, to give a clearer steer, in a sense, as to what are the national priorities that the Scottish Government is trying to achieve in the, in the national interest. It's the, it's the sort of national uh, commitment to the, the significant uh, species and habitats that we should be focusing our attention on and um, identifying what needs to be done for those priority species and habitats, and, and therefore the the attention should more be identifying which public bodies are the key ones for those key actions and, and focusing the reporting and the delivery on those ones rather than um, encouraging reporting on uh, lots of good but not necessarily those key things delivering the national priorities, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I, do, I don't think we should discourage activity in other areas, but in terms of the, the national policy priorities, it's to reverse the decline in the state of nature and focusing on the key actions that can do that is the key issue, in my view. Okay, Alec Neil. It's actually picking up the... On what Lloyd has just said, and that is at the moment, there's a long list of public organisations required to, on a statutory basis, provide these reports. And the danger is there are so many reports, so many organisations reporting that nobody is looking at this, you know, across the piece. Uh, and as you say, not actually pursuing the national priorities, but perhaps getting diverted into all sorts of cul-de-sacs that are not adding a great deal to biodiversity. So is there a need to streamline the number of public authorities who do these reports on a statutory basis? That doesn't stop people doing it on a non-statutory basis, but around the national priorities. And is there a need to give a body such as SNH uh, or the Department of the Environment under Rosanna Cunningham the statutory duty to, as it were, pull the thing together at a national level, which I don't think really happens just now? Would anyone like to respond to that? Uh, well, if I, if I may, I'm sorry to hog, but, but what uh, Mr. Neil's described is what I described earlier as the missing link in the steps of the implementation of the biodiversity strategy, and that is pulling together at a national level the action plan of yeah. what needs to be done by whom for the key national priorities. And I think putting that on a statutory basis and then flexing the reporting procedures so that it focuses on those national actions would be absolutely the right way of focusing resources and effort on the key priorities. I, th I think that's maybe a recommendation that could come out of our report, possibly, convener. Okay, possibly indeed. Thank you, Mr Neil. Alison Anderson. H having said what I've said, I think it is really important locally and for, for Dundee City Council to have some kind of reporting mechanism, because I think we could do more for biodiversity locally, and to get that buy-in is really, really important. So I don't know how you square that one. Let me ask you, Alison, just before I bring mm -hmm. Liam Kerr in, um, are public bodies adequately resourced to comply with these reporting duties? I mean, I'm very aware of the pressures on mm -hmm. your local authority in mm -hmm. terms of social work, education, and all the key things we expect local authorities to do. Absolutely. Are we expecting too much of local authorities to ask them to have this, to do this report as well? In the current climate and current financial climate? Is it adequately resourced? In one level, I think it is. I mean, I can, I can, we could pull together a report about what we're doing for biodiversity relatively easily, but I think the, the information underpinning that, in, that, that, that reporting is, is certainly missing in Dundee. We haven't had a wildlife survey, for survey carried out 
in Dundee since the year 2000. So we're talking about information that's 18 years old. Fortunately, we've been able to rectify that and we're getting quotes back actually tomorrow about getting every survey of our local wildlife sites. But the, we, we're doing actions, but I don't think we really understand whether we're, we're impacting positively on biodiversity. Anecdotally, yes, of course, but I mean, we've got red squirrels, we have grey squirrel control and that sort of stuff, but I don't actually know how many red squirrels are there. Mm -hmm. um, Just out of interest, why, why, why is there that 18 year gap since that kind of survey has been done? Priorities. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Liam Kerr. Yeah, a couple of questions arising from uh, what's been said. First of all, the, the cost of producing a report. Uh, so how are public bodies actually resourcing this in terms of, I, I would have thought if you have a statutory obligation to produce a report, you'll probably need some specialist employee and or some training for current employees to produce whatever it is that you're supposed to produce. And that indeed begs a question, is there a, a template? How much detail does one have to go into? Is that mandated? Uh, before I ask something else, could could someone tell me that? Do you, how do you resource this as a public body? Fiona, Alison, do you want to? Yes. Yeah. Um, as I said before, we don't we're not we don't have a, a local biodiversity partnership. We don't have a biodiversity officer per mm -hmm. se. But 30 years ago, I was employed as Dundee Urban Wildlife Project Officer by the then Nature Conservancy Council for Scotland, and I've. Although my role has changed significantly, that people always come to me about biodiversity because they assume that I still know. Um, but presumably, then you have to stop whatever it is that you're doing on a day-to-day -day level to produce a report. And, and to be honest, that's happening more and more. Right. As as the the, the staff complement sh shrinks, we sure. become multifunctional. And how much time does produ production of one of these reports take your organisation? <laughs> How much time did the report that we've done? Mm. Oh, um, I, to be honest, I can't. I, 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 I can't remember. But um, we have a lot of it in our heads, of so course. we just sit down and write. Can I so. throw that same question into Fiona Stewart? Because so you were saying, in in the great scheme of things, you don't necessarily have so much biodiversity going on within your organisation. So how much time is your organisation spending resourcing? The production. Like Hals, it's difficult to say a specific amount of hours, um, days and such. It's it's the staff resource um, time and the expertise to pull together the aspects. It's We pull together a range of things which are done across the organisation to form our biodiversity report. Um, so we don't have a biodiversity officer, we don't have that expertise um, and specialist in terms of writing this report. So um, through a sustainable development group, we have added this to um, one of the actions that we do to pull together the information to form the report. So it's, we mm. do stop doing other things to enable us to have the time to do this. And what happens? Yeah, so, so you produce a report. So, uh, Alison, you were talking about you've produced this thing, you put it in. If I may be blunt, who, who reads it? Like, who gets it? And what happens if you don't further conservation? Who, who checks it? Who decides this is Dundee Council, RSPB are not sufficiently doing whatever you're supposed to be doing? And what are the sanctions? Nobody can read it at the moment. It's, it's not been posted by the Scottish it's, Government, it, is that correct? But it's on our website. Right, it's on your website. Yes, yeah, so if you did biodiversity report Dundee, it would, it would come up, hopefully. Um, who sanctions it? Obviously, um, that has gone through our elected members and through our committees and seen by chief officers and stuff. So no, but what what happens if you don't do it? Like, let's say you just well, don't produce the report. To be honest, we didn't produce the first report. Mm. And what happened? Nothing. Well, well, no, 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 no. That's it was noticed by our community, who actually said you haven't done this, and I think that's that's was great from 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 my my perspective because it actually got us together and started just thinking about how we could get the next one together so i mean we, that that helped to be honest so that we were brought to task by our community 
the community, Alison? Is that community groups with a specific interest in the environment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lloyd Austin? Um, just very briefly, um, first of all, RSPB is not a public body, so we, we don't do one of these reports. We are a very active partner in a lot of biodiversity projects around the country, both nationally and, and locally. Um, but uh, from a non-public body perspective, I think the issues you're raising really underline th th this issue about ensuring that the resort whatever resources are expended on these things are expended on the, the most important actions and activities and that there is some form of feedback loop uh, that... Um, checks whether or not the actions that are necessary to deliver biodiversity are done. And uh, I think that applies equally to the Scottish Government as it does to uh, the, the other public bodies, if you see what I mean. So uh, the duty applies to the ministers as well as to uh, public bodies. And the, the uh, ministers produce a three-yearly report that it submits to Parliament as well. And Parliament is the one that should be responsible for scrutinising and checking up that ministerial report. And that's, again, something that hasn't uh, had much attention. I think the Environment Committee did once uh, have a, a brief session on, on looking at one of those reports, but not much more than that has happened. So I, th I think identifying uh, the, the priority actions and then checking up on whether those priority actions has happened is a is an important issue that I think scrutiny of this kind could encourage more of. Mm -hmm. I'd like to bring in Alistair Key um, to tell us about his public body and the impact of this reporting duty on NHS, Ayrshire and Arran. And then I'm going to bring in Willie Coffey, but I will come back to you, Liam, if, if you'd like. Mr Key. Um, just to echo, yeah, the, the others that we have a little to no resource um, for for this reporting requirement. Um, we, unfortunately, yes, it's it's mandatory, and that therefore we we do we do com uh, complete the reports uh, from the goodwill of the people who, are very, who take keen interest within the organisation to to improve uh, mainly public health and our sustainable management steering group um, take it on board as part of our uh, forms part of our um, sustainability policy. Um, but in terms of resource, no, we, we don't have any, any assistance uh, or any uh, anything within the organisation to, to help. We feel that we should be maybe a kind of more, a greater commitment nationally to help mainstream this and give resourcing to the boards, the NHS boards accordingly, to help um, us also transform our outdoor estate and to also help us fully meet the requirements of the biodiversity duty. You'd need more money from the Scottish Government to properly meet these duties. Definitely, we definitely need resource to assist. Okay. Uh, well, the good thing about the cloud, if I may add, the good thing about the reporting is for our benefit, it shows what, what can be done with absolutely no resource. We've not spent any of uh, our capital expenditure in the NHS on our, our programme of works. We've, we have all done, achieve, all our achievements have been done with funding externally to the organisation. Yeah. Um, work like a kind of demonstrator project uh, um, around our green space initiatives and in biodiversity across the estate has all been carried out without uh, funding from the actual capital. Um, it's not again; it's not seen as a core business for us um, in, in any way whatsoever. Um, so it's it is very difficult. Okay, I mean, Mr. Key, you're energy manager for NHS Ayrshire and Arran, so I imagine you're under a lot of pressure to reduce. Uh, electricity bills and all that to get costs down but does it fall does this biodiversity duty fall to you and your team to manage then um i get i'm just i'm just a one person and i kind of look after our sustainability and environment and it falls on the sustainability remit yeah um so i kind of i assist where i can to try and pull uh, reports together thank you willie coffee Thanks, Kildare. Just to maybe remind uh, friends and colleagues that the whole purpose of the thing is to try to integrate nature conservation within the kind of public processes. And I suppose the reporting is at the tail end of that, how the public bodies or otherwise have or haven't achieved that. And uh, I'm looking at the submission from a colleague from East Ayrshire, Annika, who couldn't attend today, but she's citing a couple of examples where it's becoming more embedded in practice within East Ayrshire. For example, to consider protection through planning and building standards. They're, they're already doing that. 
And what they also do is that they, they have to uh, maintain a protected species service, a European Union guidance on that when, when they're considering maintenance and capital programmes and stuff. So they're beginning to embed this, and I think that's probably where the value of the process is rather than who reads the report, but although I'd, I'd quite like to read the report. So I think there is a sense that it is becoming embedded, it is becoming accepted, certainly in East Ayrshire. And it was just to ask colleagues if you get that sense across the rest of Scotland, is that taking place, if, if not the reporting itself? Craig McAdam would like to come in on this. Yeah, I was, I was going to just say, just before you started speaking, that, um, that the whole idea of this is about mainstreaming biodiversity and getting you know your 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 everyday activities to be thinking about how how you can help biodiversity. So it doesn't necessarily have to cost much to do that. You know, it could be about reducing your your mowing regime on your your green space or your road verges. You know, so that's actually potentially a, 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 a cost saving there. But it's, it's really about how you can adjust what you're doing and to make sure that biodiversity is getting taken into consideration in the same way that our impact on the climate or energy or whatever is, is being taken into uh, consideration in decision making. Alison Anderson. Um, I was just going to say that, um, like the, um, the evaluation of the reports, that the first reports kind of says that just because people aren't public bodies aren't producing reports doesn't mean to say they're not doing anything for biodiversity. One of the reasons why I could bring this report together so quickly is because we are doing such a lot. Um, um, and we, we have done for a number of years. Uh, our local development plan has a couple of policies that protect local wildlife sites and um, wildlife corridors. We've got green network guidance. We, we have a number of operations and sites and things. So the, just because we didn't produce a report the first time around didn't mean to say we weren't doing anything. And it, it is relatively well embedded, I think. We could do more, obviously, but... OK. OK. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you. Just um, because I was sitting next to Alison, I could have a quick look at the, the Dundee plan, which you say is on the, the website. But there's just a couple of things. Just You say that Tayside as a whole does not have formal biological record... Or, Biological Recording Centre, unlike Fife and Aberdeen. And then you also say that the new Tayside Biodiversity Action Plan excludes Dundee. I mean, is this just a sort of a mosaic, but it's not joined up? Yes. Um, tradi uh, uh, traditionally, we haven't had a rec local record centre. There's been a number of attempts to set one up, and I think that's why... Um, I was relatively ret reticent in bringing a, a report forward, because we, I think we need more information... And, 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 and I know that is going to be a resource cost, for sure. Um, and more guidance on what's required in the report. Is that what, what you mean? More information? About, sorry. You say you need more information. Is no. that more guidance on no. what should be in the report? I mean, no. biological information, sorry. Right. So the local record centre would collect together biological records for a certain area. We don't have that, that kind of baseline information there, which Fife does and Aberdeen does. But I think Tayside, if I'm right, still doesn't have a local record centre, doesn't have a central repository for local records. So it's difficult to, to, to like I said before, it's difficult to tell whether you're going in the right direction or not because you don't have that baseline information. And that getting those biological records together is, is resource intensive. Okay. And that's why it's never been established. I'm going to bring in one of the policy people on that yeah. point, Craig McAdam. Yeah, so um, a number of years ago, uh, I was involved with biological recording in Scotland and brought a petition to the Parliament, which um, ended up with the establishment of the Scottish Biodiversity Information Forum. Um, now, that has now been going for, I think, four or five years and has just is just putting together the business case for uh, how we deal with biological recording across Scotland to make sure we have got that coverage and um, because it was when we put the petition together we we saw that there was uh, this, this patchwork of, of different types of record centers the museum in in Dundee does collect records but it's not a functioning record center it doesn't do the, all the services like um, uh, you know planning searches and things like that um, but the idea is that this um, the Scottish Biodiversity Information Forum's business plan, if you like, will uh, establish recording across record record centres of a type across Scotland. Okay. Can Would I anyone else to like to come in on that point, or 
No, I'm just. I just want to make sure everyone. Okay, Alison. Can just respond to Craig. Um, yes, McManus do collect records, but they don't actually put them on any any kind of system. So if if you ask if you ask a question, can I have some information about X? There will be quite old records rather than what's, okay. what's gone in since. Okay, so there's an right. information point there. Alex Neil. There's maybe also a recommendation in there that we should make it that um, whichever national body is charged with pulling all this together should actually try and get a, you know, a national, pull all the local databases together to try to get a national picture because it seems as though a lot of information maybe get raw data may be getting collected that's not being used as effectively right. as it could be. I'm glad we teased that out because we're putting all this evidence to the Cabinet Secretary next week and it's a good example of the difficulties public bodies are having in, in um, fulfilling the reporting requirements. Colin Beatty. Thank you. Um, we've heard quite a few bits and pieces about where there are weaknesses in the system and things could be done differently and so on. What could the Scottish Government do that would make it all work better? Is it, or is it, the, is it the Scottish Government that could take action to make this work better? Sally Thomas. I can't speak on behalf of the Scottish Government. No, I think he's Sorry. asking your opinion as to how this could work better, who needs to take action? Well, we work very closely with government, um, so um, I wouldn't, I'm not really in a position to go into detail on some of the work that's already underway. Certainly, we've, we recognise uh, after the first round of reporting in 2015 that there were um, some, I suppose, difficulties with public bodies understanding, and that's why we put in place the work on the evaluation and the guidance and the, the templates and so forth. Um, there are a number, I suppose, of, of glitches in the system which we could look at to see whether they would work better. I mean, currently, um, biodiversity duty reports are, it's not a requirement to submit them to government. It's advised. There's a, you know, there's, there's, we could look at the scope, whether that should become mandatory or should it come directly to SNH, for example, for us to publish on the website. We currently do that, but they're forwarded on from Scottish Government. So there are those sort of process issues which we could certainly look at within government. But I can't, I can't comment on, on what government should or shouldn't do, I think because we are too close to the process working with government. Fine. OK. Would anyone else like to answer? Lloyd Austin. Um, I think there's a, a, a few things I would say um, that government could do. I think, first of all, um, on the information question that was discussed earlier, um, government could give backing to the ideas from the Scottish Biodiversity Information Forum about um, how all that information can be better collected and managed. I think uh, <coughs> a reconsideration of the sort of priority action planning process that I spoke about earlier uh, and some steer to um, other departments within government as well as public bodies would be uh, a useful uh, step that Scottish Government could take. I think um, Scottish Government, I think, also needs to recognise that it itself is a public body in, in, in this kind of discussion and that uh, some uh, better coordination of um, the, 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 or integration and embedding, as was the phrase that was used earlier, of biodiversity across different government functions, uh, agriculture, planning, transport, etc., uh, might be another thing that could be, uh, Scottish Government could do. And I think um, in terms of the contribution to the sort of global picture, I think we need to recognise that this duty stems from the Convention on Conservation of Biodiversity that began at Rio in, in 92, uh, but currently um, everybody is working towards what's called the HE targets for 2020, uh, which were agreed at the Conference of the Parties in Japan um, in 2010, and are going to be reviewed at the next Conference of Parties in 2020. The what, sorry, just for the official report, Mr. Austin, the what targets? HE targets, they're called. It's, it's A I C H I. It's a town in Japan where the targets were globally agreed. Okay. Um, and uh, um, SNH produced a very useful report recently on the progress in Scotland towards uh, delivering those those targets, but. Um, we were on track in only six out of 20. So I think there's some work to be done. Uh, although the, the press release highlighted that we were the first to report that we were only on track <laughs> for six out of 20. 
Okay, Sorry. Sally Thomas. If, if I could just come in on that, I think, I think there is a danger that we conflate too many things into the biodiversity duty. Um, I mean, the, the, the duty is, uh, is around um, public bodies and the way they exercise their functions. Um, it's not a duty to deliver against the international targets. Clearly, though, those targets are extremely relevant. And um, some of the, the, the public bodies who have a lead role in delivering on some of the targets, we are working very closely with them. And that will, will be and is reflected in their biodiversity duty reports because that's you know, a large proportion of the activity that they're currently undertaking, working with us to do that. Um, but I think we just need to be careful we don't, we don't conflate a number of different things which are set up for different purposes. That's not to say I don't agree on the need to kind of prioritise action. Um, just as a, a kind of a further point, as part of the biodiversity strategy delivery, um, SNH have set up a number of what are called delivery agreements with some of the key public bodies who are delivering with us on a whole range of partnerships, projects, many of which contribute to those international IHE targets. Um, and those have been very helpful for those bodies in terms of how they frame their duty report because it gives them um, a clear set of priorities which they're working to and which they've committed to and which they can then feed through into the way that they are performing when they come to produce their report. Okay. Craig McAdam. Uh, I've, just before you, you started that second part of your point there, I was going to say that, you know, the 80 targets are important because, you know, they should be what is driving our national targets and then down to the local targets. So I'm if, not if saying they're not important, but I think... Well, they're important in this context yeah. of the, the biodiversity duty, because if a, a public body doesn't know what they need to do, as Alison has, has said, about what do we have to do to, to uh, help with the national targets, if, if those national targets are based on what we need to do to meet the HA targets, then that should all flow through there. But the, the key bit that's missing is what does a public body have to do to meet those targets? OK, I'm going to bring in Alison Anderson and then I'm going to try and pull this discussion together a bit so if people can think about any final p or points that they need to raise or want to raise. Alison Anderson. Just to follow up what Sally was just saying, I think Dundee City Council would very much welcome some help with a delivery agreement from SNH. Um, and I think that... And that was I was going to bring that up because I read your evidence so, to help link the things together. Happy to do that. Okay. The so, sorry, can I just Alex Neil. Just to emphasise the point Craig just made, because I think that's a very important point. And I think what Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, was saying, what matters here are outcomes, <coughs> not what you're doing uh, or how you're doing it, but actually what the outcomes are vis a vis the targets. So maybe one of the recommendations we should consider, depending on what we hear from the Cabinet Secretary next week, is that the duty should relate directly to achieving the targets rather than just a list of what you're doing and, and so on. Because in a sense, that's almost irrelevant. What matters is achieving the targets. And it seems to me we should shift the emphasis completely in terms of the reporting towards the outcomes rather than the internal processes. Lloyd Austin. Um, uh, I'm going to agree with Mr Neil again very firmly because I think uh, that the link to the national targets, which are drawn from the international targets, and the actions that are necessary to meet those national targets, whether that's by national public bodies or local public bodies or by other departments of government, that is the focus. Those are the actions that we need to, to see and we need to ensure that the reporting is on actions that deliver outcomes. And if we look at our national data on our biodiversity, we see that we are not meeting those national biodiversity outcomes. And the, the need, therefore, is to, uh, in a sense, um, reduce the effort on reporting on process and uh, increase the effort on delivering actions that deliver outcomes and focus the reporting and the scrutiny on whether those actions that deliver outcomes are being taken. Okay. I think that's, qu I think that's quite a good note to, to, to uh, bring our discussion together. But Liam Kerr. Uh, 
All right, I'll try and bring it together, but just on outcomes that we can take and their reporting cycles, uh, it just East Dumbartonshire Council talked about uh, a, a reporting duty uh, or to report to be published on the 1st of January that covers the previous three years. Now, I didn't quite see where that came from, but uh, it, it, I guess it will be accurate. Uh, East Dumbartonshire were suggesting that that is actually problematic <coughs> because, of course, it's the 1st of January and there will be time off and that. Uh, that means the report is not that it will be front-loaded, so actually it won't capture uh, what's been done in perhaps the last six months. Is that a reasonable concern? Uh, and if so, uh, would it be better not to have a report on duty on the 1st of January uh, and have it pushed back? Is that something that would benefit? Okay. Mr Kerr, can I take that question and add a little bit to it? Because my final question was... What, chain, if, what, if any, changes would you like to see in the statutory requirements, i.e. the reporting duty, inclusive of the deadline, as Liam Kerr raised, but are there any other changes you would like to see, and do you agree with Dumbartonshire's point that that deadline should be changed? Can I ask maybe the public bodies? Fiona Stewart. I mean, we said in our response that we thought it would be appropriate for the list of public bodies to whom the duties apply to be reconsidered, um, to focus on the bodies to whom the duties are more directly relevant. Um, and if the list of bodies were to remain as at present, we suggested it would be beneficial for the reporting requirement and guidance would be on a much more proportionate basis, um, appropriate for the different types and sizes of organisations. Um, and in terms of a deadline, Yes, 1st of January is maybe not the, um, the easiest date um, to achieve, so something mid-year, not financial year-end, would okay. be beneficial, certainly. Thank you, Fiona. Alison Anderson. Um, as the, the deadlines for the reporting, when we sent our report, it actually missed off a few months, to be honest, because we had to get through committee and we had to prepare it well in advance with timescales of the staff as well. So you, you are missing a few months, but... I would presume that I could tack it onto the next one and it would be relatively flexible. Mm -hmm. But um, I was also going to say, to, to just add to Fiona, what Fiona said, it ha I think the duty has to be proportionate. I mean, not all local authorities are the same. As you know, Dundee has a really tight administrative boundary. It's very, very urban. And yet, you know, um, Highlands Islands, would be, it, it's completely different with a complete set of bio different set of biodiversity and different priorities. So I think there has to be some kind of proportionality. Yeah. And of course, the public bodies are mentioning, I, I assume for Alistair Kane, for Fiona Stewart, for National Museums and for NHS, it's a matter of getting the report ready and getting it past the chief executive. Whereas for councils, it's a different kettle of fish, isn't it? Because you've got to take it to committee. That takes weeks for papers to be tabled and all that process. So it's um, maybe that that needs to be considered as well. Alistair Kay, would you like to say if there's any changes, certainly to the 1st of January deadline, or any other changes you'd like to see to the statutory requirements that would help you with this? Yeah, I think in terms of the 1st of January deadline, it would be good to maybe tie it into the end of November along with the climate change reporting. That would that would help because um, the papers could go through the governance procedures, um, which can take uh, maybe up to three months to go through the various board groups. Um, so, yeah, maybe bringing it forward would be beneficial. Um, it would be good also to capture within the reports uh, the impacts of the um, interventions on the natural environment that have been carried out. Um, and perhaps with the review and identity of good, the good practice across the public bodies with a view to sharing uh, and obviously the learning and promoting uh, collaboration between boards. I mean, with the regionalisation of the NHS, it could be the fact that um, even the, the kind of four regions are, uh, do their own biodiversity report and do it regional, for regional working. That might be a possibility as well. Okay. Any further points? Willie Coffey. I was just hoping to bring up the issue about public engagement in the whole process and where it sits, if anywhere. Uh, how does the public get involved in the process? Do they, do they notice that reports aren't posted and is that when they come in or do they get involved at early stages? And Lloyd, when I was chatting to him earlier, was talking about a lovely project in the Garnock Valley. So I was just wondering, how does the public engage with the process and shape what it becomes? And should they be much more involved in the process looking forward? 
Would any of the public bodies like to comment or shall I bring in one of the policy people? Who would like to answer? Lloyd Austin, you look like you want to speak. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll come on to Mr Coffey's question because I was going to say something about the previous things. I'm not sure where the date came from, to be honest. The, the statute actually says that the base date is the date when the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act came into force. So it probably stems from that. Uh, January reporting yeah. deadline you're talking yeah. about. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, but uh, I see no reason why we would object to... Uh, ministers trying to change that date if it if it makes things more uh, practical and deliverable uh, in terms of um, the cycle of public body uh, process. I think the one thing I would change about the duty is is the issue about uh, focusing it on priorities and actions that deliver outcomes, as we discussed earlier. Um, and I think uh, actually that may be where one of the issues about the public may be getting involved because many of the priority actions, um, the, the biodiversity strategy at the moment is, is in the form of uh, a, what the Scottish Government called the route map, which has a series of priority projects. Uh, and each of those projects has a series of partners. Uh, RSPB is a partner in, in many of them, as, as are other uh, voluntary organisations and uh, the public are very involved through those different individual projects and I think that is the way uh, that the public can most benefit and be involved in in those projects and I think that is an example actually of that, that route map and the projects in there. It's not in my view complete as an action plan of priorities but it's a step towards that uh, yet that isn't part of the reporting process. Do you see what I mean? So. Okay, thank you. Alison? Uh, a couple of points. Um, I referred to when I spoke earlier about the kind of tension between the national significance and the local significance. Um, I think it's really important to bring your community along with you so we don't have sea eagles or Cape Cayley or significant biodiversity like that we do have seagulls that fly over dundee though so that's good seagulls that fly <laughs> yeah. over dundee. so so it, it's trying to relate the biodiversity duty to the, the things that our community find important in dundee as well as trying to satisfy the national targets as well and it's that kind of balancing thing because people get very passionate about trees being cut down in dundee but yeah i mean we're they figure they climate change obviously but you know where do they figure nationally but they're very very important and indeed equally there are the same number of people who don't want trees so we have to balance that as well so it's just i think community needs to be in involved because if they're not on our side then how would you do that alison i mean you raised an interesting point on willie coffee's question earlier because you said that community groups had been in touch with you and the fact that the council hadn't produced mm the previous re year's mm -hmm. report and was encouraging you to do so. Mm -hmm. Do you think more could be done to engage the community in this? Yes. How would you do that? Resources, though. <coughs> yes, it's a resource issue. It's, it's a res it was a, we, 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 work, we work in partnership with a lot, of, a lot of groups in Dundee. We help support them. We help them to achieve what they want to achieve <coughs> in biodiversity and green space. So we do work in partnership with a lot. And, and I think that's... The way that we're kind of going because we're re reducing resources but and we need we need the help of our community to help maintain our biodiversity but obviously we can't we don't always make the right decisions in their in their eyes okay thank you <coughs> does anyone else have any further points they would like to make sally thomas uh, just to clarify on lloyd's point the the the, the date is is set out in, in terms of the legislation that's where that that date comes comes from um, and also to say, in terms of SNH's um, duty report, because we're required to produce a report as well, we very much report on, um, on the outcomes and the activities and the work that's happening rather than on the process. And that's very much what you know, the guidance that's out there and the templates encourage public bodies to do. On the local engagement point, I think there's a strong role for the um, local biodiversity action partnerships who work with um, a whole range of different organisations locally and work 
on the ground with communities, with school groups, with local action volunteers and so forth, and in, in the majority of cases are very well plugged into the local authorities in their areas. Um, and I think they, they do a fantastic job in terms of that wider community engagement on biodiversity on people's local patch. Okay, thank you. I think in terms of um, how this is taken forward, there was um, some good suggestions earlier from Alex Neal and Lloyd Austin elaborated on those a bit. They will be in the official report and these are points that all of your points and evidence um, will be put to Rosanna Cunningham, the uh, Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, who is giving us evidence on this uh, very topic next week. Can I thank you all very much indeed for your contributions and for your time this morning. Your evidence is very much appreciated. And I now close uh, the public session of this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>